hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one, you will hear two teachers, Andrew and Katie, discussing the coming excursion of their language class. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Well, we have this school excursion plan, but when exactly is it? Is it this Tuesday or Wednesday? Well, it can't be Tuesday with the English tests taking place. Ah, right, not Tuesday, but Wednesday. That's right, all day Wednesday, taking a bus outside the city. The excursion is on Wednesday, so Wednesday has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Well, we have this school excursion plan, but when exactly is it? Is it this Tuesday or Wednesday? Well, it can't be Tuesday with the English tests taking place. Ah, right, not Tuesday, but Wednesday. That's right, all day Wednesday, taking a bus outside the city. And where are we going? Ah, uh, last month we went to Arthur Island, so this time we're going to the animal park. Arthur Island was OK, but it was too cold. Let's hope the weather for this week's excursion is better. I don't suppose animals care about bad weather, but I certainly do. Have you heard the forecast? Yes, and it's not too bad. Basically, they're saying Monday will be sunny. Good. But then the weather will change. Not so good. Yes, Tuesday we'll have some showers, but by Wednesday, the day of our excursion, it will be, well, their words are cold and cloudy. Cold and cloudy. Well, as long as it isn't wet and rainy, I'm happy enough. We won't need umbrellas, just warm clothing. And what time will we get there? Let's see. The bus picks us up at 8.30am and then it's an hour and a half on the road. So we arrive at 10am. Sorry, with the 15 minute break, that will actually be 10.15am. That's early enough. Then all our students can see the animals, have their fun and do whatever they want to do. Well, one fun event planned that day is birds of prey. What's that? That's when they bring out several birds of prey, eagles, falcons, kites, those sorts of birds, and throw pieces of meat into the air and the birds swoop down and eat them. It's quite impressive. Sounds great. Birds of prey. Are there any other activities? There's a catered lunch at the park restaurant. We've already paid for that. And in the afternoon, there's... Well, I had a choice between the reptile display and the koala handling. In the reptile display, the students can handle live pythons and various other snakes. Surely they'd rather hold koalas. I'm sure, but the koalas can't be handled unless the weather's sunny and given the forecast, I thought it better to choose the reptile display. Um, that's a shame. These Asian students would love the koala handling. Yes, I know, but we can't control the weather. And then we get back. What time will that be? We leave the park at 4.30, but then we face traffic, so we won't get back until well after 6pm. It will most likely be 6.30, but that's better than the last trip. We didn't get home until 8.30 that time. Yes, that was a bit too late, wasn't it? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Andrew, I understand you've been doing some research regarding the breakdown by nationality of our student body. 
That must have produced some interesting results. You're right. I got some statistics from head office. I would imagine that most of our students are either Japanese or Chinese. You imagine right, but it's the Chinese who constitute the majority, but only just. I had thought Koreans might be second, but it's actually the Japanese, quite close behind. It's somewhat surprising, but obviously all those study tours that our university markets in Japan are bringing in students. What's the breakdown exactly? Japanese are a quarter of the whole, which is considerable. Last year they were only sixteen percent, so that market has grown nicely.、Uh, the only other proportions of some weight are the Indonesians and Koreans, about the same. Indonesians at fifteen percent, and、uh, the Koreans are a little higher, not like last year when they were less than ten percent. I thought we'd have more Indonesians than Koreans. Well, as I said, they're about the same, just like the Saudi and Thai student numbers, almost the same also, both just under ten. Which one is bigger? Uh, Thai students number just a fraction more. As for the other nationalities, collectively they're only three percent, so it wasn't worth giving each of them a separate category. I just grouped them under other. That's Vietnamese, South American, a couple of Russians, and so on. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a university administrator telling a group of new students about the central campus buildings and the facilities they provide. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to sixteen. Welcome everyone to the Brandon Complex, the geographical and we could say spiritual heart of this university. This is basically where everyone eats too, as you can see by looking around. There are many different cuisines here: Chinese, Indian, and Middle Eastern, plus the usual fare of a local type, all in that corner over there. We have many shops here too, but the biggest is Wilson's, right there, providing clothing and hardware. That's next to all the restaurants. Now, on the opposite side of Wilson's, we have three shops. The one in the corner there, closest to the restaurants, is for DVDs. Yes, the DVDs are cheap and affordable, and you can also rent DVD players as well. Moving on. In the corner directly opposite Wilson's is the student union office. Incidentally, you are all encouraged to join the student union, as a student union card gives you many benefits, including discounts on basically everything you can buy here at the Brandon Complex. Outside this complex, on the other side of the road, you can just see it from here. In fact, is a building that we call by the rather unusual name, the H Building. Next to this, on the other side of some trees along the main road, is the Engineering Institute, but that doesn't have anything to do with the Brandon Complex. One last thing is that just outside this door, near us here, you can see a grassy oval patch. Well, that's the playing field for what we simply call the fitness room, which is alongside. So you can put on some calories here at the restaurants and then burn them off at the fitness room afterwards. 
Oh, I forgot to mention this shop right here, in the middle, beside the student union. It's the bookshop, and as you can see, it's always busy, always popular. You can buy newspapers, magazines, and stationery there, plus a few clothing items as well, just as you can at Wilson's. Why don't you go and take a look right now? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions seventeen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions seventeen to twenty. Now I'd like to tell you a bit more about one of the buildings here, namely the H building. Despite its bland name, you might be interested in what goes on there. It is our main recreational centre, with halls, offices, and space available for a variety of activities, mostly for those who want to get fit. For example. If you're interested in yoga, you're in luck, since four days a week there are free yoga classes. They have several levels, so if you're a beginner, you'd have to start with that. You can check the schedules on the wall there. Yoga used to be at night, but now it's in the mornings, but not on Wednesdays. Along those same lines, there's aerobic dancing in the afternoon. This shares the same room as the badminton games, which are on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. The aerobics are on the alternate days, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and it's not restricted at all. Everyone is welcome to join, although the instructor may divide you up, of course, according to ability. And just to show how diverse the H building is, there's even some spiritual solace available there inside the multi-denominational prayer center, with individual booths and a variety of holy scriptures and texts available to read from all the major religions of the world. That's open all day over the weekend, but not at night time when the rooms are for private booking. Finally. For those of you of a cerebral nature, the University Chess Club operates at night. That's open from eight p.m. every. Uh, is it Wednesday or Monday? No, sorry, Friday, and I think it closes at about eleven thirty p.m. So, there's something for everyone in the H building. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three, you will hear a conversation between an undergraduate student, David, and his tutor, Dr. Smith, about David's plans for doing a master's degree. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Now listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Right. Well, David, I think it's a good idea to talk a little about your plans for going on to do an MA. Now, I understand you're thinking in terms of either Forth College or Haynes College. That's right. Well, so far, anyway. No, I think that's a good choice to have narrowed it down to. I'm interested to know how the services to support students work in both places. Yes, I know you've needed to make use of those here in the last year. I have to say, I'm not absolutely sure about the situation at Haynes. I expect they're all right, but certainly Forth has a good reputation in that regard. 
They have a large number of students from abroad, and they have to make sure they're okay. That's reassuring. And then I'll be moving city again, obviously, whichever college I go to, and I hope that the room or flat I could expect would be nice. Very important. Yes, these days actually, all colleges tend to have decent quality rooms or flats for their students, and Forth and Haines are no exception. Right. Well, what about comparisons on the academic side of things? Hmm. Well. I know you're an avid user of the limited online provision we have here. I think you'll find Haines is about as developed, <laughs> or not, as we are here, and that Forth has developed some pretty impressive stuff, which I'm sure you'd make the most of. Well, I'd certainly try. But that doesn't mean that the more traditional information sources, such as the good old-fashioned library, should be forgotten. No, of course not. While Forth has recently had a very splendid law library opened. That isn't particularly relevant for you, and I think you'd find Haines' general university and faculty collections better suited to your needs. But that's something you could check for yourself if you visit both places, which I'm planning to do next month. Good. Now there's the question of the lecturing staff, which is clearly going to be key to your progress. I think you'd find them adequate at Forth. There are some solid people working there.、Uh, while Haines have recently taken on some inspirational people, very cutting edge. <laughs> it's a little hard to judge, though, because as a research student, it's not as if you have teaching all day every day. No, I guess not. But I'll need to consult. Yes, and on the subject of research. In terms of the college's reputation for results, again, neither place is bad in any way. But I think you'll find, and you can check this on the Research Council's website, that Haines has consistently scored very well. There's perhaps a little bit of an issue with non-completing doctorate students at Forth. Well, I'll certainly look at the website as you suggest. <laughs> Fine. Now you have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now listen to the rest of the conversation and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. I'm still a bit anxious about making this next step. I know the level of competition is very high, especially in my area. It makes me feel rather daunted, and I wonder if, in a new place, I may be out on my own, if you know what I mean, compared to the sense of community here. I suppose it'll be down to my determination to succeed to get me through.、Mm. Well, do remember how you felt when you arrived here. I'm sure you'll get on anywhere in the end. I hope so. And of course, you still don't know exactly where you want to end up. By the time you've completed your masters, you'll have a clearer idea of whether you want to progress to doctorate level. It's possible, I suppose, that you'll begin to see how much you might be interested in picking up some bits of lecturing earlier than that, since your area is fairly specialised and may put you in demand sooner than you think. To establish yourself in your area of expertise. It would be sensible to think in terms of getting your stuff into one or two of the journals, converting parts of your dissertation into suitable formats for them. That'll stand you in good stead, whatever else you decide to do. That sounds like good advice. Thanks. Actually, I think master's level studying has improved in some ways over the last few years. <laughs> the internet you love so much was always going to make all kinds of studying easier, or that's the idea, anyway. <laughs> I'm not sure it really has the impact you might think. What I've found impressive is the way courses have developed to be more adaptable, more able to fit in with all the other demands in people's lives. So while the exams and assignments you all have to do may not have shifted much, at least a wider range of students are now able to benefit from education at the higher levels.、Mm. I just wish I could be sure I was always making the best use of my opportunities. At the end of each week, I usually feel I could have got more done, arranged things differently, been more efficient somehow. I've got a lot better at taking down notes during seminars and lectures, which means I think that my written work has benefited to some degree. So there's progress on some fronts, at any rate. <laughs> yes, it's interesting. See, that is the end of section three.
You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a geography lecture on the British Isles. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello. I'm glad so many of you have turned out to hear what I have to say today about the British Isles, that area of the eastern Atlantic that we Americans find so confusing. I'm afraid just looking at a map or a page in the atlas doesn't necessarily explain the geographic terminology. In referring to the British Isles, a word of apology for those of you of Irish descent, that is, those whose ancestors come from Ire, the Republic of Ireland. No matter how geographically accurate the place names that I use today are, some of you will be understandably upset to be included in anything termed British. I have a very useful image that might help you differentiate between the various labels that distinguish the political and geographic reality of the so-called British Isles. I want to show you a Venn diagram, which is a mathematical illustration that shows all the possible relationships between sets. Look at this Venn diagram, and you will see that the geographical terminology is in bold, while the political terms are in italics. See here the British Isles in bold, and the British Islands in italics. The aim of this lecture is to explain the meanings of and relationships among those terms. In geographical terms, you will see that the British Isles is an archipelago made up of the two large islands of Great Britain and Ireland, and including many smaller surrounding islands. Of course, you can't tell from the Venn diagram the true comparative size of these islands. You'll need to look at the map for that, but take my word for it. Great Britain is the largest island of the archipelago, followed by Ireland, which, in reality, geographically, lies to the west, and there are over a thousand smaller islands. Now, in political terms, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is the constitutional monarchy, which includes the island of Great Britain, some small nearby islands, although not the Isle of Man or the Channel Islands, and the northeastern part of the island of Ireland. Thank goodness it is generally shortened to United Kingdom, the UK, Great Britain, or Britain, or even the abbreviation GB, although none of these are strictly correct, of course. You'd better listen carefully to the next part, because, I warn you, it is very confusing. Ireland is the name of the sovereign republic occupying the larger part of the island of Ireland. But to distinguish it from the name of the island itself, and most importantly from the other part which belongs to the UK, it is called the Republic of Ireland, or its Irish language name, Eire. That's E-I-R-E, -E, even though Eire directly translates as Ireland. The smaller portion of the island is called Northern Ireland. The partition of Ireland took place in 1922, after a great history of struggle that we won't go into here. England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland are legal jurisdictions within the United Kingdom, but Great Britain refers to the countries of England, 
Wales, and Scotland as a unit. The British Islands contain the United Kingdom, the Channel Islands, made up of Guernsey and Jersey, and Isle of Man, which all have the British monarch as head of state. Interestingly, the Isle of Man, although governed as a British Crown dependency, has its own parliament, but relies on the UK for defence and in matters of external relations. So, you've learnt something about the geographical and political confusion surrounding the British Isles. Let's have a look at some of the linguistic confusion. To start with, there isn't an adjective to refer to the United Kingdom, so the term British is generally used. However, that means that citizens of Northern Ireland, although not on the island of Great Britain, still describe themselves as British because this reflects their political and cultural identity. Irish, in a political sense, refers to the Republic only. So sometimes citizens of Northern Ireland would call themselves Northern Irish as a point of difference. Of course, the Northern in Northern Irish is not completely accurate either, as the most northerly peninsula on the island is in the county of Donegal, which is part of the Republic. Okay, we might get in a muddle over the term Irish, but at least Scottish, Welsh, and English should be self-explanatory. Apparently not to us Americans, and Europeans are often guilty of this too. We often use the term English incorrectly to mean British. I'd have to be the first to admit to calling my Welsh colleague English, which really gets his heckles up. He is Welsh, he tells me, and he may also be British, but he is definitely not English. Just one more thing. What is the British Commonwealth? It's a voluntary association of independent states, many of which were former British colonies. In fact, what was primarily the old British Empire. However, it's no longer known as the British Commonwealth, but is now called the Commonwealth of Nations instead, presumably because current members do not want to remember the old colonial ties. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.